You've worked with the mayor. You have made a donation in the form of uh, Ripple cryptocurrency to SF State. Do you feel a responsibility to do all of those things? Just explain the why, first of all. Yeah, well, you know, I love the city. I was, I was born in the city. My parents met in the city. Uh, and, you know, it's the most special place in the world. Um, you know, we have our issues, but um, there's just nothing like San Francisco. Uh, you can't replicate it. So it's worth fighting for and worth uh, investing in. What is a better use of time to hand over money to, to initiatives that you think will work or to invest your own time being sort of actively participating in the life of the city? Well, I think if, if you can do both, you should do both. I mean, obviously, people that don't have the resources to contribute dollars, for example, because you can make impact that way for sure. But there's a lot of things you can do uh, just as a citizen. Showing up for you know, police commission hearings, for example, yes. that, that makes a difference. Uh, so I think all of us can do things, but we're fortunate to have resources. And you know, even though the city has a $14 billion budget, the problem with the city is it's all tied up in a knot. So private money sometimes can rapidly make impact in things like police recruitment or supporting small business, um, or maybe even trying to battle some of the nonprofits that haven't really been all that constructive in terms of helping the city fix itself. Well, what is the knot, to your mind, or the cause of the knot that, that's kind of holding the city back from making progress? Well, I think we've... You, you've got a board of supervisors that doesn't work with the mayor. That's a huge problem. And unfortunately, that can only be addressed in the 24 election. And there's a lot of people focusing on that, including, you know, we're, we're focused on that. We hope we can change that and get a board that works with the mayor. That's step one. But there's a bunch of long-term stuff where the charter has just, you know, uh, really limited the, the power of leaders to do, I think, the things that are so obvious that have to be done. Um, a lot of these problems we have, uh, they're not hard to, to figure out what we need to do. It's just we've tied ourselves in a knot and uh, we haven't given ourselves the power. It's too, it's too bureaucratic. That's going to take five or ten years to sort of really fix some of those problems. But thankfully there's some folks that are working on that and uh, that's encouraging. There's been an, a focus on the part of town that we, we call Market Street where a number of technology companies have their headquarters. Union Square is close by, and you have focused on that part of town as well. Why? Well, uh, you know, Union Square is a, a huge draw for the city. Uh, it brings in enormous revenue for the city. It's kind of the, had been the crown jewel, uh, but it's suffering, uh, suffering from all the same issues that, that we know about in the city. And, and, and so we have to address that. Uh, downtown, I think, is going to get fixed and is in the process of being fixed. Prices are coming down. That's drawing people in. We got an AI boom going on, so there's. I, I, I'm, I'm actually not worried about that. But then we also have to help, uh, you know, the the merchant districts out out in the uh, the outer parts of the city. There's 34 merchant districts. I, I had actually didn't realize that until we started looking into it, and that's a rich diversity. But uh, that's something you've done in partnership with Mayor Breed in the we've, past. We've done that through uh, a nonprofit that we we stood up called Avenue Greenlight. So we've got about 3.7 million to make small grants to these merchant districts and help out those small businesses that have really suffered through the pandemic and through some of the other issues we've had. But these are people that are committed to the city. It's like 100,000 jobs that are related to small businesses. They need our help. Uh, so we, we like helping out there as well. And your relationship with Mayor Breed, what are your current interactions with, with the mayor and her office? Look, I think the mayor is doing a fantastic job in a very difficult, uh, not just an environment with problems that we have to solve, but again, with not having the, the authority or, or the power to do things that we all know have to be done. So that must be a frustrating job. But she's committed, she's tough, she's strong, she knows what has to happen. And look, she's, uh, look, she's a mayor who grew up in a housing project, single mom. Um, she knows what it's like to fear the police, but also knows how important the police is to protect your community and, and your family. That's a pretty unusual combination of public safety and, and criminal justice knowledge and thought coming together. Why don't we trust her to make the right decisions and unleash all this bureaucracy that's held her back? That your relationship to the police, as best I can tell, is you, you've invested in, in put into place a, a network of security cameras, essentially, 
uh, the, the easiest layman's expression. What is the, the thesis there? If you install your own cameras, do you intend, I suppose, to hand over the data or the, or the increased surveillance power to the authorities, or do you, do you use that yourself? Well, just to correct there, Please. so our, our uh, participation with camera networks, uh, we just give money to uh, one of the 18 community benefit districts. They're nonprofits, community uh, governed neighborhoods. So think of Fisherman's Wharf, Castro, Mid Market, Japantown, and they handle all the cameras. They keep the data only for 30 days and they work under best practices, no audio, for example. So I think extremely privacy aware, but also recognizing we have a public safety issue in the city. And cameras are, are another tool. It's a force multiplier that helps out a, a police department that is hugely short of manpower right now. So we need those kinds of tools. But very importantly, we, have, we don't control them. Yes, we you don't have yourself the data. are not up a ladder installing no, them. No, not at all. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, I've been warned not to ask you this question <laughs> Uh, because you've been, you've fielded it many times before, but it's a fair one. If you are so focused at the board level here in San Francisco, and you work so closely with Mayor Breed, and you believe that it's not just money that, that can be a solution, why do you yourself not run for a public office where you oh. can have an impact? <laughs> I'm just not wired for that. Uh, you know, that's you have to be a special kind of person to want those jobs. So, in my view, these are jobs I don't want, right? But and I don't think I'd be that effective at it. At it, what I can do though is I can help with resources where they're needed, and maybe with some ideas around some of the things that, you know, can help the city. Tools, for example, the police need. You know, there's a lot more things than just cameras. They need drones, uh, they need AI tools, they yes. need better recruitment. So we need, there's a lot of work to be done there. Every day on Bloomberg Technology, we, we talk about San Francisco in the context of being the AI city. It's having a positive impact. Yeah. But we don't talk about San Francisco as the crypto city. Yeah. Is that something you recognize? Well, that's, a, that's really unfortunate because I think, unfortunately, uh, this administration uh, made a really bad call. In, at the city level or at the federal uh, level? At the federal level. They pretty much killed San Francisco from being what it was, the blockchain capital of the world. We owned it uh, and we don't anymore because the Biden administration, for whatever reason, decided they want to push this industry offshore. And so it's London, Singapore, Dubai that that really are the global capitals of blockchain. That's unfortunate. We, maybe our vacancy rate would be half of what it is here in San Francisco. It's 30%. It might have been 15% if we still were the global blockchain capital of the world. So that was a missed opportunity. It's really unfortunate. It hurt the city. The, the latest with, with Ripple <clears throat> Labs uh, action at the federal level is that you have objected to the SEC's request to appeal the original court ruling, which was a positive for Ripple in the sense that it found the cryptocurrency XRP was not a security mm -hmm. um, when it was sold to the public. Could you just explain what the latest is with that legal dispute? Well, I think the bottom line is the SEC lost on everything that was important to them and important in regulation of the industry. The case still continues. There's, there's appeal processes that everybody has the right to do. Um, but uh, we think that, that this is really groundbreaking uh, this is the law of the land, and it is actually quite good news, I think, for, again, I think the U.S. screwed up here on, on crypto and blockchain policy. This is the beginning now through the courts, unfortunately, instead yes. of through regulators, to get that clarity and get us back in the well, game. Well, there's kind of both happening in parallel. There's your situation with the SEC. Think about the applications pending for uh, Bitcoin spot ETF. You know, yeah. Gary Gensler and the SEC have both decisions to make on applications and fights that they are, are or are not willing to pick. How has that reflected on Gary Gensler, to your mind, as, as lead of that well, you bring up a, Yeah, you bring up a great point. You saw in the latest the challenge on the ETF, uh, the Bitcoin ETF, again, SEC lost. But not only that, the judge really admonished the SEC, uh, really called them out in a way that you don't really see very often. I think it's just more proof that Gary Gensler's uh, decision of sort of engaging this regulation by enforcement, rather than getting clear laws, he knows they're not clear. He just likes that lack of clarity so that he can go after anybody and make up the rules as he goes along through bullying. And that's not the American way. 
This should be a Congress. We should have clear rules from the legislatures, not through these sort of unelected, power-hungry, and really misplaced decision makers that you see in Gary Gensler. Uh, Chris, you, you reflected, even lamented, what's happened here in San Francisco vis-a-vis -vis the, the cryptocurrency industry uh, or block, underlying blockchain industry. Is, if the U.S. is not the place to do business, where do you all go? Is there a better jurisdiction that has a firmer handle on things? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, when people, uh, entrepreneurs ask, I say, don't start in the U.S., unfortunately. Um, you go to London, you go to Singapore, you go to Dubai, where they have, and this, it's not because they don't have any rules, quite the opposite. They have clear rules that protect consumers and also celebrate innovation. Why isn't America leading that call? That's what we've always been, and we got to get back to it. And by the way, that's the engine that has made San Francisco what it is. And to have the federal government hamstringing us, just, it's just unacceptable.